And um, we organize like this. There will be a very short presentation of the four panelists. And afterward, uh, we will uh, focus on a specific topic. We will have uh, some reaction from them on this uh, specific topic. And afterward, we will open the discussion with you. Uh, our guest, our panelist here is Hamad. Is him? Is Stefan? Is him? Is uh, Anne? Is she? And is Ben? And uh, I leave the microphone immediately to you to present yourself. Good morning, afternoon. I'm not sure anymore. Um, my name is Anne Richard. I live in Berlin. Um, I founded Ready School of Digital Integration which is teaching refugees, or we should call them newcomers, um, to code. And we started in August last year um, doing a lot of pilot testing, really working very, very closely together with the refugee community in Berlin. And then we started in February, and our first group of students will graduate. There's 37 of them, and they graduate on the 9th of June, so very, very busy at the moment, but honored to be here. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stefan. So um, since two years, we're working uh, on a platform aiming at any time you need a service or an object. The platform introduced to you the one that is ready to offer it to you for free. The project was last year the most crowdfunded social network ever in France. Um, and by that time, we saw that in Greece, many people asked us to, to try to create a community there. And uh, it corresponded with the, the refugee crisis. And many of uh, newcomers were arriving there. So uh, the platform is now being tested. And we decided to try to address the platform and just to get the information to them that they can be helped by Greek people directly that are ready to give them the service or the object they need. So we are uh, now testing with the hundred of refugees in this moment, and uh, it's being a big success. Um, so now we have thousands of uh, subscribers, but the platform will only be released in uh, November. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about what's going on there. So. I got my mic, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi everyone, thanks you for joining uh, the sessions. My name is um, Ahmad, I'm a Syrian social entrepreneur, born and raised, uh, lived my whole life in Syria till now. Um, I work in a couple of different initiatives. This is like the most complicated questions I ever get when someone asks me, what do you do? Uh, I manage the operation for Techstars, uh, a global ecosystem in the Middle East and Africa. Beside that, I work to support uh, my fellow friends and uh, families, the Syrian entrepreneurs uh, inside the country and also in the Middle East and recently in Europe. Inside the country, we basically organize uh, social events uh, like Startup Weekend, a um, couple of meetups, workshops. In the Middle East, um, we have established a new program called Shisur Entrepreneurship Program, which is the basic idea to bring uh, student entrepreneurs and student startups sort of around the MENA region to three weeks boot camp to help them scale up and develop their business. We have a competition program. We give them like grant funds uh, to establish their startups, whether it's like a uh, tech startup or social uh, enterprise startups. Uh, and also we give them uh, and peer them with the mentors that can help them uh, during the program. Uh, so far, we had two different events. Um, we bring together 13 different startups coming different parts of the regions. Uh, most of the people come from uh, inside the country in Syria. And recently, I, joined, uh, I moved to Europe uh, accidentally, like less than a year. Uh, I'm trying to also help um, support the Syrian entrepreneurs uh, in Europe um, with, with several of initiatives, but mostly advising um, do some more workshops and events uh, for Syrian entrepreneurs. Hi, I'm Ben. Um, I started something called uh, the Jamia Project. Um, it's been going a few months really since the end of last year, which is when I, I was work before that I was working in the Middle East on the refugee crisis. Um, the aim of the Jamia Project is to provide relevant and accessible higher education for refugees. There's probably quite a few organizations you may have heard of working in this space. I think the interesting thing about us is that we're trying to work with refugee academics. And in particular, one project we're working on is um, uh, working with refugee academics, pairing them with European universities to deliver online courses to refugees in the Middle East. Uh, we have a couple of other projects as well. One is getting academics to, or refugee academics to help uh, Syrian refugees transition into 
uh, courses in, in Europe that they're accessing, whether it's in the UK, Germany, Spain, France. Um, and they were also working with, um, or starting to work with, an NGO called InZone and Princeton uh, University to run a, simul a, kind of, uh, a simultaneous MOOC in global history around three places, Azarak Refugee Camp, Kikuma Refugee Camp, and Princeton University itself. Thank you. So, of course, uh, uh, if there are some specific interest on uh, the four uh, uh, activities that have been presented, it's okay. But what we thought to do is terrible. What we thought to do is to try to focus on one point. And uh, the focus could be on the idea of connecting diversity, that is the title of this panel. Uh, it's well known that uh, the connectivity that normally we talk about is uh, very good in putting together people that are similar. So the issue is what does it mean if we try to use connectivity to put together people that are very diverse? And this issue is a weight, in my view, and in the proposition that I will do to discuss to the panelists, when we talk about the migrant issue. To talk with a kind of slogan, in some way we are all migrants, so the wave of migrants that arrive today are only showing something that in our society is already there. And uh, therefore we should or could imagine that our collaborative activities could be the best way to put together the new migrants and the residents that in some way are migrants too. And uh, we could discuss about this, but on the top of this, there is one point that seems to me, and also I discussed with the colleagues here and seem is shared, is that it's not only to discuss how each individual initiative could uh, uh, promote this kind of a collaborative inclusion, but what is the story that all together we are capable to tell? And uh, to make it short, uh, there is a very strong story that is uh, given by the racist, the right wing, that says about uh, Europe, this is a kind of homogeneous uh, com uh, community of people that is not like this, we know. But this is enough to create a big populist movement. We, when we talk about uh, the positive attitude, we have a very poor story. We are cap capable to say we should welcome, that is good, but it's not enough. Sometimes there is a kind of economical story, we have to welcome the migrants because somebody has to pay for our taxes, our pensions for the future, but also this one is not a very strong story. So what is the story that can be told to make uh, possible for people to imagine a better Europe that this morning I synthesized saying a younger, more dynamic, more open, cosmopolitan Europe. And uh, my question to the panelists and to you afterwards is even how what we are doing can contribute in building up this kind of narrative. Thank you. So I think first of all, I'd like to just ask the people here, how many of you are working with refugee projects? Put your hand up. Okay, so like one third. Um, how many have ever met a refugee? Put your hand up. Okay, that's really, really good. I'm very, very happy to hear that. Um, what has been sort of the guideline in the work that we've been doing is really to have the motto, stop talking about refugees, start talking with refugees. Because I think it's so important. There are so many narratives. We can't just talk about one. But it's powerful when two people meet. And what I've definitely experienced in the last year is just the incredible amount of talent, um, the incredible resilience in the newcomers that I'm working with. I've, I've never, I think, met such a talented group of people in my life, and I have been working with very, very nice organizations before, but the strength that is in that community is very, very transformative for me and the team that I'm working with, and I think we just need to scale that up. We need to have many, many more conversations with refugees then it will start creating itself. Uh, yeah, so as far as uh, we are concerned uh, to be uh, transparent, uh, so we've been testing the app for uh, many months and we just started our experience there is uh, three months ago, I would say. So it's my real first contact also. Well, it's rather the hard team in Greece. And it's really interesting, in fact, to uh, 
uh, share uh, the point of view on the digital things. And to answer your question, Enzio, um, there is one statistic that is, uh, was really motivating us to go to Greece and to try to address to the refugees our solution is that 82% of the people uh, arriving on uh, European borders uh, from Syria notably are digitalized and they are really aware of uh, uh, the technology innovations. So we decided to go and not trying just to address a solution for the refugees, but just try to include them in the, you know, in a platform where the Greek between them could help one another. And why not these newcomers also integrate and socialize them because they are ready to offer also. They are skilled, some of them are really skilled, and they are really ready to offer some things to the Greek people there. So um, we are uh, also, because there is a difference when you imagine the refugees, let's say the, the newcomers, and when you start to get in contact with the community and you see how diverse uh, the people is killed, how diverse are the stories. And uh, I do share your opinion. The first step is just to try to encounter and to understand uh, these uh, people, uh, these newcomers. I think that the, the term is really better accurate. We can be able to, the others' mics. Um, so basically before we can be able to discuss how we can possible to able to collaborate uh, and going back to the same point can be shared here is realizations. Um, realize that those people who's coming, they are really skilled. They are people, they need a shelter, they need safety, but at the same time they are doctors, professors, uh, engineers, they are the skilled people. And to realize the power that uh, inside those people can come us to the point that there is a huge resources in those people. Why we're not using it? Why we're not collaborate? Uh, so basically, immigrants are twice luckily to establish a business than the local people. Twice luckily. I'm not saying that the local people that are not eager to establish, but let's face it. When you just to start again from the beginning, you moved on a different country. Uh, you 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 came you came down against all the odds. Uh, you came to your last chance. This is when you have no choice but to succeed. And this is the refugees' mentality. They move to the different countries, they get for them another chance. They escape death, they escape uh, horrible things that are happening uh, in, in their countries. They wanna start again um, from the beginning. So for, the, for a lot of refugees, and I will say for all the refugees, uh, it's a game for winning. This is, a, this is an opportunity for them to win. They are not playing with percentage. If I wanna start something, I might be able to fail, but they starting something because they wanna succeed. They want to win in this. By realizing this um, as, 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 a, as Europe, for example, and uh, governments, organizations, people, that there's a huge resources. Those people are willing to, to do a lot of stuff. Then you realize too how we can be able to collaborate and find more stuff and open the local resources uh, for a lot of people. This has been done uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it was easier because um, there is no cultural barriers between um, the peoples in the Middle East. Um, I believe the last studies that are published by Turkish government says uh, the Syrian, uh, Syrian businessman, they established 6,000 uh, different businesses. They contribute $10 billion to the economy uh, with the growth. Uh, some kind of initiative that taken place in Beirut, people start to open the businesses uh, in Amman as well where they start to contribute to open manufacturers, and there's now a couple of few initiatives. So for me, this is start with realizations, the importance of these newcomers and the potential they can be able to do, and then uh, build a diversity, which is the second things uh, I believe to start to be done. Uh, try to integrate more people, build diversity among those talented uh, people together, uh, give them uh, the way they can be able to do it that will turn into the third things with culture. Uh, this is, will become part of our culture. We not start to um, difference people uh, and labeling them by like refugees or not, which is like we are co-founders, we are co-workers, we are co uh, classmates, and we start to understand this more uh, together. I think I'd re-emphasize two things that have come out from those, from your three, three points. One is kind of changing that narrative at an interpersonal level and then changing the narrative at a kind of higher policy level. And there's a p report that's come out today, actually, which in, is by the Tent Foundation, and it's called uh, Refugees Work. And apparently, it's, um, it's, there's an LSE academic who said, um, for every euro that the, um, the EU and all the EU countries has put in 
to supporting refugees, in the next five years, Europe will benefit uh, two euros in return. So basically doubling the return on that um, over five years. And it backs up what you're saying around the impact of migrants on, on communities. I think I'd, I'd agree with you, Ezio, in, in that the economic uh, argument is actually quite light, and you need to open up that to, uh, um, to realise the social value as well. And that's probably what lots of our initiatives can do, actually, is is around this realisation of skills and, and the value that, um, that refugees and migrants can bring to a community. Um, and that's definitely behind our initiative, is, 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 is realising that lots of these refugees are extremely talented um, and trying to break that top-level narrative um, that's, that's unfortunately dominating, especially in London, where I'm based. Um, well, funnily enough, not in London, because we've just voted to um, uh, uh, elect a, a Muslim mayor, so kind of a support for cosmopolitanism, um, but I think in the UK more broadly. I think then in collaborative and sharing movements, I think at a lower level, it's stuff like you were talking about, Ezio, earlier, um, these uh, um, community gardens. Even something as small and as local as that is kind of bringing, is establishing space between different communities um, and breaking down the kind of these top level narratives that are very that are dominant at the moment and and highlighting the complexity around migration and around uh, refugees and the stories that need to be told okay thank you um, I, I will not try to summarize but I think that there is a kind of common point of view that now I will leave the floor to the audience and it's um, maybe to do the best is not to imagine something special for the migrants, but imagine to go on doing, uh, in, in a place like this, what we are doing, that is very interesting, very trying to be collaborative, and to open this collaborativeness to the newcomers. So this, in my view, is the best way to reframe the issue about migrants. So. Often, for what regard myself, I use uh, this term, the need of reframing migration. The first step of reframing migration is to understand that each one of them are human beings with capabilities. So is the first one. The second step in reframing is to consider that um, <clears throat> they could be part of the solution, not only part of the problem. But the third and most important one is that we could do something together for the sake of an overall community in which we are in some way peer, the newcomers and the world that are in Europe since a long time. And, uh, and by this point of view, in my view, we should not have, uh, now it's good that we have this special session on migration, but uh, the message that I will launch to you and I hope they will be spread with all the others, that it's not a specialized issue to deal with the migrant. It should be what we normally do in our normal activities, especially when we try to be collaborative. Given that, uh, we have enough space for uh, discussion, so before having again uh, the panelists, maybe we can collect some questions from the public. Or comments, or whatever. Hi, uh, I'm Natalia, and I have worked with migrants in the past in my work experience. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, when you talk about the fact that um, migrants are twice likely to start a business, what do you think they lack of? Is that coaching? Is that legal assistance? Is that um, a good environment or platform to share ideas and best practices? And if there anything that has already done in some sort of communal knowledge meant? Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, were they lacking off, I think, a lot of stuff? Um, and this is shocking. Because fir first, what I think they're lacking off, uh, they are talented. They become with a talent. Most of them, they've been, t uh, they've been coming to the school, but left the school, they left the universities, and they came here. So, but unfortunately, there is no background check on those people. They, the only questions they, they've been asked when they, re they were here, uh, their names, their age, uh, Etc. But never been asked, are you a programmer? Are you a designer? Are you a marketer? Never been asked this question unless they get their papers done and they start to learn the language. It's like basically one year 
uh, long. So we have like an idle resources been left, not being collaborated, not being shared for like a one year. Uh, this is like the, the one of the challenges. Uh, second one, uh, working permits and, and, and environmental recreations. Uh, what is the government trying to do in order to let those people establish their businesses? Uh, how much hard for them to establish this business? This is vary from country to country. Uh, I'm probably um, from a state to, to different state. Uh, but this is also one of the problems that people uh, are facing to establish this. Um, also sense of community. So the refugees, entrepreneurs, or those talented people, like really diverse. They are really like uh, isolated. Uh, they live in refugee camps. They're going to learn the schools. They they start to forget their talents, and then they start again. So we need also like more initiatives that can be able to bring those people together uh, and build diversity and get all this diversity to build the density uh, around those um, those and start to collect them uh, in one place that get them a sense that this is your your now group of community. Uh, you are talented people, you should be able to contribute back and then start to collaborate, uh, integrate those with, uh, with the local uh, entrepreneurs. So just like very basic things, I would say it again, um, more a community, more like governmental recreations uh, for those people to have the freedom to work and act, um, and more understanding of, of these values. That's what I think for me. Um, anyone would like to? So maybe I'm expanding a little bit on the question. But what we realized is internet in refugee homes in Berlin is very, very poor. But you can imagine if you're 600 people living together, it is difficult. But it's something that is not being looked at, but it's something that could definitely make a huge difference and speed up integration massively. Second thing that we realized is it's really, really hard to concentrate if you live with 600 other people. So actually having a space where you could sit down and focus to either do your language lessons or to work on a business, um, continue studying in an online university. These things are really, really difficult. They're very, very practical, and there will be practical solutions to these, but they would make a massive difference. Hello. Um, I really appreciate the, this view that you ex explained that um, the fact that we call it a crisis and uh, um, the, the issues we're talking about when we talk about migration today is just the image of existing problems of our society and is just reminding us of some segregation issues that we have anyway in our society. And I, I'm very interested to hear from you who are working on this issue. How did you manage in your work to overcome this this narrative of us and them. Okay, they have specific needs maybe today, urgently, but um, how do you make more inclusion narrative instead of uh, just helping and aiding uh, assistance kind of discourse? Okay, that, that's a really relevant question. First, day, first thing I, I, I want to say is that I'm just going to talk of my uh, fresh, recent example. Um, we went to Greece because most of the youth were in need and they are really keen on how, what are the alternatives to organize themselves. So the platform aims at giving any service, any object anyone needs and to introduce him, the one that is ready to offer it for free. Concerning the uh, newcomers, what is relevant is that we only think about what, is, what are going to be the issues because of their coming. But I'm observing that uh, many of, uh, of our members, of subscribers, are people that are really ready and open up and they have the time and they have the will to share. And here we are the We Share Fest and it's really interesting because a sharing system works with people that are ready to give. And what I do observe, but it's really recent to me, is that these people, that is, most of them are skilled, uh, some have incredible diplomas, they are ready to give. And here, since we're talking about innovation, and me as an entrepreneur, and as a collaborative economy entrepreneur, I can say that the refugee crisis, it's an incredible chance for the many projects that are here, because there is people that is really, really willing to socialize, to participate to movements, to many things. So I would say that we have to, for, of course it's recent and the medias are also culprit of uh, this vision that we have, but as entrepreneurs, as innovators, as all wh wh what we are do doing, maybe some of you are here, we have to try to uh, uh, realize 
h how an incredible opportunity is also uh, to get people motivated uh, and really wanting, uh, willing to, to get socialized. So th that's my point. And I think it's really a matter of changing the platform. So of course, if we look in our passports, we can say you, you and me or, you know, that we are different. But what we're doing with our coding school is to create a shared platform. So we are all coders. So we had a beautiful experience. We had Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook come and visit our students. And it very, very quickly became, here's Mark and here's Rami. They're both really, really passionate about artificial intelligence. And they were discussing how humanity and technology can be combined. And very, very quickly, because they were sharing the same language and the same passions, it didn't really matter that one was the founder of a massive company and the other one was a refugee waiting to be allowed to work because they were sharing the same passion. I think it's just important to shape that platform that allows people to meet and, and share passions. Um, I just, I'd add to the, um, in the idea that there is a migrant crisis in Europe, I think is a bit of a misnomer. Um, so, uh, and I think you're right in identifying it as a bit of a European crisis. Uh, if you look at the scale relatively to the Middle East, Europe's pretty comfortable. Um, so, for example, in Lebanon, you've got about a fifth of the population are refugees. Now, apply that to the UK, um, then you're looking at a refugee population of upwards of uh, 15 million people, which would be huge. Um, I think, I think the, the crisis is a, is a failure of policy rather than, um, and it's been too reactive. It hasn't, been, it hasn't um, actually got ahead of the game. I think on, the, on overcoming a narrative of us and them, I don't think, I think that's just an ongoing challenge with all these sort of projects. I, I think that's just something that you have to, um, in terms, of, and then in changing that policy and the response, that's something that you need to perpetuate as part of your message that's coming out of your project. Um, so one, one kind of big thing that we're always trying to push is there are about 100,000 Syrian students who can't access university. There's also about 4,000 Syrian academics who have left Syria. Um, so there's a huge pool of potential there. Um, and how, how, do we, how do we tap into that? How do we make use of that? Um, and when you tell people, even in somewhere like London, that those 4,000 Syrian academics exist, that's a really surprising statistic to them. And I think we're still a long way from overcoming that narrative of us and them because it's still, um, it's, a, it's so deeply embedded from refugee crises in the past. Um, historically, there has been a very, um, well, a less skilled population and uh, a much needier response. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of the one, one of the things you need to kind of perpetuate through these sort of initiatives. So... I uh, just came back from a month for a microfinance project. I want to ask you, is there one role for microfinance um, in this game? Is there a role for microfinance? I'm not an economist, but uh, I believe there's some pretty, um, I know the Center for Global Development um, there's a guy called David Rodman there, I think. He's done a lot of research into microfinance. And at an aggregate level, what microfinance does is actually, although we're kind of off topic now, I guess, a little bit, but um, microfinance sustains a level of income. It doesn't get people into the it kind of, it doesn't increase their income, basically, over, over the long term. So in this context, I don't know, but at a broader level, I'm unsure about the evidence of microfinance. Um, because it also pushes people into debt. So lots of, lots of, so if you've just been in Amman, lots of refugees there and probably the same in Lebanon, they're already building up a huge amount of debt, paying for housing because they can't work. So I'm not sure whether that's a particular solution. But perhaps, you know, if you think about it, you step back a bit, perhaps the, in the w same way that microfinance was innovative perhaps 30 years ago, you need to start thinking of different financing models. I think in the long term, yes, but specifically what we're looking at is early intervention programs when you are not allowed to work and you are not allowed to make money in any sense either. I think it, what is really interesting to start tackling is how you can transfer social capital that you can build up within the first, say, seven to 12 months when you're waiting for your asylum papers to then transfer that into actual financial that you can start buying an apartment or but that transfer is really important because it's difficult. I mean, finance, at least in Germany, would be very, very difficult in the first, let's say, 12 months. 
Sorry, since you studied in this area, uh, I would be uh, interested to, to have your opinion about that. Sorry, Inman? Inman is in um, uh, Jordan. So uh, I think that uh, microfinance, how it works is mainly um, giving small sums to people with projects. So they you need to ju uh, justify what, they're, what they want to do with this money. Um, and it's sometimes a good way to start a, a small business. So it works for uh, local people in uh, Jordan. And I was thinking if maybe people that are skilled and they have a, a good project, if it could be a great way to start something, even in countries in which um, they, are, they are new. So that, uh, that's why. Some other questions or comments? I was wondering, because um, uh, in an abstract notion, I'm from the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands it's quite, um, the, there are negative stories and there are positive stories about refugees in the Netherlands, and the negative uh, seem to have more impact. And I'm, I was wondering if you guys uh, who are doing such a good job also uh, find the audience, find the media, uh, the mass media also, uh, to change that perspective uh, and to, uh, in a bigger sense, uh, keep societies open for new refugees. You, you want to say something? Um, in my opinion, um, the last months, let's say, were the uh, first uh, period of uh, the refugee crisis, even though it lasts for uh, many, two years, let's say, or a little bit more, maybe. Um, but now we're entering in a new era, I do believe, because um, there is many uh, new projects, uh, sharing projects also, that are raising at the same time of uh, what's happening in our generation. And as Ezio said, uh, allowing the refugees to be part of of this movement and to social to permit them to to socialize. So these beautiful stories, I do think, and this uh, movement is now the new time, the new era in which we are entering in. Um, and the, the states have also to uh, handle and to manage and to know to handle with this uh, uh, the, the, the newcomers and how to integrate them. But the social, uh, the civil society as an important role, and I do believe that what we are trying to do here, and what probably some people of you guys here present are trying to do, is also uh, really important. We don't have to wait from the state only. We also have uh, the power to uh, to um, to be part of this change. And the media are following, you know, and they will follow, and they will step by step. I, I'm pretty optimistic on the fact that uh, this vision uh, is going to change. But I think part of the challenge is that the media has been so polarized, it's for and against. And, and this is the challenge. We've been very, very lucky having fantastic media, which allows us to get financial partners to say sustainable. But we are put in the, oh, everything is rosy and wonderful. Look at them. But then you have the other alternative. But, but the in-between, it's super challenging what we are trying to do. And those are really the good stories that we need to bring out. But it's this black and white media that is a, a huge challenge. And I'm hoping that social media can help being part of, of creating a lot more of a grayscale there. Because it, it is challenging and we need to talk and have a realistic conversation about it. Because otherwise we're just going to keep shooting at each other from both sides. And it's not helpful. Uh, I just want to share a different perspective like from other point of view uh, on this. And then you can guys leave it um, for comments from you. So basically, from Syrian perspective, um, the majority of suicide bombers that happen in Europe was done by people that have nationalities, the European nationalities. They are not immigrants. They are not Syrian. And just, just consider more about it. For someone like me, I'm living, born in Syria, and I love a lot of European people, like thousands of people. They escaping into the borders to my country. I'm joining terrorist groups, um, and they basically to call my, my, my own people. So this is another side of perspective, how to see it. This is like a downside of people. 
They like those bad guys who's coming to my country, they messed up in the country joining terrorist groups like ISIS and started killing the people. But still the perspective uh, that we have for the European, uh, European people, that's not them. We're humans just like them. They are not the majority of people, so we don't take this into consideration. Just like a different perspective, how also to see things. Um, I'm a little bit curious because you talked about, you know, there's in the in the media, like there's the positive and the negative and um, like the black and white part of it. But how are you guys um, working with the media? Do you have any good, uh, yeah, like insights from, you know, to, to be able to get those good stories out there and so on? Media are a funny fish to try to work with. Um, some of the best media has been the local press and actually telling the real story. Um, some very, very big newspapers um, that I respected a lot before wrote com more or less complete uh, make-up stories, quoted myself, quoted some of my students for things we had never said. Um, my two pieces of advice is first of all, have a good conversation with the journalist about what is the framing of this story what narrative is it going to create up front? And then you can also say no. Um, the second one is to always, and journalists always have to send you the quotes and you have to sign off of them before you're quoted because they will change it um, in order to fit a, a black and white narrative. Unfortunately, this is the way things are. It is very, very difficult. And I can only advise everyone, everything you read in the media, take it with a pinch of salt. Um, it's there's a lot more to the truth than what you read in also very respectable newspapers has been my experience in the last year. Um, I do share uh, this point of view because when uh, uh, we uh, arrived in Athens, there is a famous newspaper in Athens that said Indigo 2 point is the answer to the crisis. Uh, we are an NGO, right? And so um, many people uh, try to contact us and to reach us. Our strategy after this, we, we saw that Okay, we can start to communicate on the fact that we're going to find a solution for the, the Greek use, and we are also based in Portugal, in Africa, in different countries, we're creating community and to say, hey, we're coming. But we dis when we saw that this could be a strategy to create a community, but we decided, okay, until the launch, that is in November, we won't talk, we'll go only to specific and to like this, where there is experts, and to communicate about this. And first we will make the work on the field. So we will meet the refugees, we will meet the Portuguese youth, we will meet the African youth who are based, we will meet the Greek students, we will try to understand and then we communicate it to get the control because it's, you know, media really want to talk about initiative like ours, but I think that it's how well to make the work to, and then to come up to the media with really concrete results, not talking that much when we are just trying to implement. Of course, sometimes it's relevant to get the support, to get the finance, to, to show to the to people giving you money, even more when you're an NGO, say, look at the work we're doing. But I think that we, are be, it, we, we really need to be, um, um, uh, uh, to be careful with this. Uh, that, is, that would be my point. I think that we have more or less to close. I only want to ask uh, to everybody uh, to, to be a little bit activist on uh, this point, if you agree. Uh, when we finish, to go around and uh, to tell that um, the migrant issue is coincident with the issue about we share. Therefore, if, my God, why it works so well with you and not with me? Is it something? Yeah, let's, let's try if it's better. No, I, I, I really think, uh, and I will advise you to help in spreading the idea that uh, we don't need specific issue for migrants, at least in this uh, specific context. That, uh, as they said very well, the we share issue should be coincident with integrating diversities and the migrants are one of the components of the diversity of the society in which we are. And uh, to answer to the one question, many questions could have other discussion, of course, but how we can communicate better. 
I think that uh, for some reason the notion about sharing has been uh, widely communicated. And an event like this one has been uh, a wider uh, interest in the media. If we could succeed in saying, look, this event is a migrant-related event. We are the We Share uh, Fest, and the We Share Fest in the way in which it's considered here is to connect diversities, and connect diversities means to integrate and to include uh, uh, the migrants in our discussion. I think that if we could uh, formulate this uh, position clearly and try to tell it to all the media that we will meet in these days, we will do a minor but not irrelevant contribution to give a different vision to this story. Thanks to everybody, thanks to the panelists, and uh, well, see you later. Thank you very much, Edson. <laughs>